I'd like to turn to Jay to begin our discussion. Jay is a musicologist, author, and professor of musicology at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. He is the author of Violins of Hope, Instruments of Hope and Liberation in Mankind's Darkest Hour. Jay has spoken at significant public venues, including the Wheel Recital Hall at Carnegie Hall. We're very pleased to have you with us, Jay, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'm going to start off this afternoon by discussing some of the roles that music played during the Holocaust, and we will find that that relationship between the victims and the music is often quite complex. In many cases, the victims use music as a form of spiritual resistance through making music, whether it was singing or at times playing instruments, music provided a way for them to conjure up a sense of normalcy and to hang on to their sense of cultural belonging. In my book, Violence of Hope, I write about Erich Weininger. He was a Viennese butcher and an amateur violinist. And shortly after Nazi Germany annexed Austria in 1938, he was arrested, beaten, and taken to the Dachau concentration camp. There, he and 13 other musicians did something quite extraordinary. They formed a clandestine orchestra. Gatherings of any kind were strictly forbidden in Dachau, punishable by death. But it was known that on Sunday afternoons, the guards would at times be lax in their supervision. So the musicians would put together concerts in an unfinished latrine building that was being unused. There was room enough for the 14-piece ensemble and maybe 20 to 30 audience members. And so they would play these short concerts of maybe 15 minutes in length of popular classical tunes and sometimes newly composed music, and we'll hear a little bit about that in a few moments. They would play short concerts to allow as many of their fellow prisoners to cycle through as possible, playing several concerts in the afternoon. And for just those few moments every Sunday afternoon, for the musicians and their fellow prisoners, they could imagine being in a better place at a better time. At times, music actually saved lives. In October of 1940, Fievel Vinninger and his family were taken on a death march through Romania. The government of Romania had decided to round up their entire Jewish population and march them towards Transnistria, which they had recently annexed. Those who did not die along the way, as did Fievel's uncle and mother of exposure, exhaustion, starvation, and brutality, were left in Transnistria with no food and no way of providing for themselves. In the Shagarad ghetto in Transnistria, Fievel managed to get his hands on a violin. And he started playing that instrument at parties hosted by the Romanian officers and Ukrainian farmers. These were lengthy events. They would sometimes go on two or three days without stop. And Fievel would play the entire time. And the agreement was, whatever food was left over when the party was finished, Fievel could take that back to his family in the ghetto. And so by playing the violin, by making music, Fievel was able to not only stay alive himself, but to save the lives of 16 family members and friends, including his wife and his young daughter. <clears throat> Those types of stories can be very inspiring. Uh, it's a very positive feeling, but one of the things I want to leave you with is this relationship is not always so happy. There were times when music was used for more nefarious purposes. For example, in the orchestras that played in many of the concentration camps. In the large complex that we refer to collectively as Auschwitz, there were orchestras in the main camp, orchestras in the men's and women's camps of Birkenau, and throughout the various subcamps. These were ensembles composed of prisoners. Unlike Erich Weininger in the early days of Dachau, they weren't coming together for themselves and playing music of their choice for their own edification. They were required to play as part of their forced labor. 
The primary roles of these orchestras was to play at the camp gates every morning as their fellow prisoners were marched out in regular rows of five. The German marches they were required to play established the beat that instilled what the Germans referred to as marching discipline, meaning they helped the prisoners stay in step. After the last of the prisoners had gone by, many of the musicians would put away their instruments and they too would go out for forced labor. But they would be the last ones out and the first ones back at the end of the day to set the orchestra back up and start playing those marches again. In addition to having slightly less work detail, their privileged status in the camp as members of the orchestra sometimes allowed them to get slightly warmer uniforms or slightly more food. And while membership in the orchestra by no means guaranteed one's survival, for some members of the orchestra, those small privileges gave them just the advantages they needed to stay alive for one more day, and then one more day, and then one more day, until ultimately they outlived the Nazi regime. As one white might imagine, the relationship between the orchestra members and the rest of the prisoner population was at times complex. Primo Levi in Survivor at Auschwitz recalls being in the infirmary in Auschwitz III, and they could hear the sound of the orchestra kind of wafting through the air, the bass drum and cymbals, little scraps of melody, depending on how the wind was blowing. And he remembers looking out at his fellow victims, fellow prisoners, and he writes, we all thought this music was infernal. What an insult to hear such schmaltzy music in such a desolate place. Other survivors recall feeling gratitude for their fellow prisoners playing these marches helped them put a little pep in their step as they marched back into the camp at the end of the night. So they did not appear as weak and as broken as they really were, knowing that to appear sick or weak or injured, they would be seen as being no longer useful to the camp and would be sent to their deaths. The musicians themselves had complex feelings about those contributions. Some went on to have distinguished careers as musicians, Others never played again. The memory of making music in Auschwitz, of playing the schmaltzy, peppy marches while watching as their fellow prisoners at times, perhaps even including their own relatives were being marched to the gas chambers, was too painful. So just from these few examples, we can see music provided a number of roles, the use and misuse of music during the Holocaust. It's just an insight to the complexity and diversity of experiences of the Holocaust. As I like to remind my students, the Holocaust is not a single story of six million Jewish deaths. It's six million different stories, many of which we'll never know, but some of which we can come to know if we learn a little bit about the musicians and the music they made, and as we'll hear in just a few moments, the music they created during the Holocaust. Thank you.